Lakshman, and I'm going to be talking about some work that I've been doing with the uh, work with the Ethereum Foundation. Um, it's sort of like a uh, it's not particularly glamorous work, but it's kind of necessary work to get like researchers doing what we want them to do. Um, it has to do with like making sure we have a kind of a, a decentralized relay network. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, about the problem. Um, probably won't spend too much time on that because it sounds like it's familiar, familiar, but and then I'll kind of talk through what uh, what we've built so far and kind of what the next steps are. Okay, so um, this is like a very primitive data diagram about what the non-chain mixer is. I'm actually really excited about this primitive in particular because uh, it's one of those things that is pretty obviously different on-chain versus off-chain. Like off-chain, uh, like in privacy in particular, you really don't want people to see what you're doing. And so trusting someone to mix your funds, like trusting a Wasabi wallet or something like that, um, makes for a completely different user experience as something that is completely trustless and you're like hiding in a crowd kind of thing. So, um, so just, just real quick overview of how these things work. Um, you put money into the contract, and then let's say a bunch of other people put money into the contract. So you are A, say, B, C, D, and put money in, put money in. And then later, as A prime from another address, you can generate a proof, a zero knowledge proof that says you are one of those people who put money in without saying which one. And that entitles you to some of that money in. And so to someone looking, you know, someone doing like a, like a chain analysis or something like that, looking at, this, looking at the network and trying to analyze like whose money is whose, they just see four or 10 or 1,000 going in and 1,000 coming out. They can't do so, yeah, pretty, pretty powerful primitive. Um, uh, so, real, real quick overview of why relayers at all are even necessary. Um, so, one of the main things that uh, I've heard that people want to use this kind of thing for is um, funding addresses that are not associated with any of the addresses you currently have with ETH, so you can like interact with the network with them. So, in this case, let's say. A is one address, A prime is another address, want to fund A prime. And so you put money in, A prime then has to withdraw the money with this zero knowledge proof, but uh, if they have zero ETH, how would they be able to? And so that is, uh, that's where relayers come in. Um, so this, isn't, this also isn't like a, a new idea, this, uh, like many, many projects talk about meta transactions, transaction extraction. Um, the idea is for certain things you might want a third party to run transactions for you. Um, so this is what that new kind of like transaction code looks like. So A deposits money into the contract, presents a signed transaction to a relayer, who then runs the transaction on their behalf, um, and then over the course of that transaction, money comes out to A prime, and not pictured, but some of that money might come out as a fee to the relayer. It's like a reward for the service that they're providing. Um, and so this is kind of the case I'm trying to make, is that uh, the central relayer defeats part of the purpose of a trustless mixer. Um, and a lot of the projects, the all of the implementers, some of them here right now, um, are obviously shipping with a single central mixer, which is, I think, you know, when, you, when you're shipping an MVP, you kind of want to ship, like, uh, the, uh, the parts that you really want to test initially. Um, so it makes sense maybe not to do, like, a fully featured thing at launch, uh, but um, a, an act, like a single, a single relayer has, has two problems. So one, um, from a user perspective, if you know that the company running the relayer is the same as the company kind of like serving the client code for interacting with the mixer, uh, there's no way for you to know that there isn't some communication going on there, or even more kind of nefariously that like, the relay, there's some communication going on behind the scenes, like from the web server certain client code in the relayer. And if there's like some pattern in how like the time between deposit and withdraw, like in the client code, then the relayer might be able to figure out who you are. All right. So um, another thing is obviously uh, if you have a single relayer for serving a mixer, there's you know, issues with censorship, there's issues with uh, artificially high fees. Um, so ideally, we would have many relayers serving. Um, so that is uh, what we're trying to solve with Surrogate. Um, it's, uh, 
we're currently in the, pro in the process of integrating it with one mixer. We're looking to integrate it with everyone else. Um, so it's like pretty, I would say pretty alpha stage, but the ideas are that like anyone, like you or I could just run uh, like a Docker container that isn't really there and you immediately be a part of this network. Um, any existing mixer doesn't have to change their contracts in any way to, to use this and just has to change the client code. Like change, literally install an NPM package and change how they find their layers. So this, this part, I'll, I'll kind of go over the main parts of what this is. Um, I, might, I might try to actually speed through this because, uh, I don't know, like it's a little, little technical and, and, and leave more time for questions. Um, but this is kind of like analog to the previous diagram where we looked at where you had like someone who's trying to interact with the mixer, you have a mixer contract with a relayer, and we're adding these four components um, the really key parts are the client, which is like an NPM package that you can put in the wallet or mixer client code. Uh, the daemon, which is just like a, <clears throat> kind of the server of the relayer essentially. And then two more contracts that are uh, necessary, um, but uh, sort of serve as a discovery mechanism for relayers as well as like transaction forwarding. Um, these, we have like our first, we've, we've kind of been doing some research into the right way to do reputation in particular, and so we have like a first implementation of this stuff, but we're also talking with uh, like the gas station network to see if we can kind of integrate with them. And they, they I see as kind of filling, filling that role as well. Um, so first, talk quickly about the client. Um, so so the client's main role is uh, find relayers, so communicate with the reputation contract. And um, so, so the idea is that, like, let's say this is so this is a client, this is a user. So this is also where, like, let's say the wallet code or the mixer client code in your browser or on your mobile. Um, and so, through our library, it talks, it figures out where your relayers are, and it allows you to submit transactions to those relayers. Um, and this is like structured pretty simply in the GitHub repo. You can see it's just like an NPM package. And right now I have an example of getting the best relayer IP, of course, that could be like the core address or something. Uh, doesn't really matter. Um, but that's designed to be very, very simple. So next is the, the daemon. Um, so really what we're, we're, we're going to uh, share like a reference sort of API that this should expose to properly communicate with the client. Um, we were also releasing like a reference implementation of this that does some like fancy stuff around transaction simulation. But this is something that technically like anyone can create a custom custom version of. Um, you know, if uh, if this becomes like a high volume activity, you'd imagine that people would want to create like really high performance things that look at the network and make sure you're not getting front run and stuff like that. Right now we do some very basic uh, like transaction. So so basically what what happens in the current version of this code is. Um, for any transaction, uh, it uh, simulates running that transaction, sees how how much running that transaction changes your own uh, ETH balance, and if it's like a, beyond a certain amount, basically, like so. It's, um, and I yeah, it's super simple. Um, this if, if you're if you have Docker installed, it's literally just running uh, like a few commands to run that. So. This is designed so that like anyone could run it. Um, it would be really cool if like like random people run relayers. Uh, oh yeah, this is this is the these are the two critical pieces for this spec. Um, there are some other there are some other there are some other um, routes, but um, basically like for a given transaction, like you need to tell clients what the fee you charge is, and you can tell a client, and you need to be able to submit those transactions and share the transaction. Okay, um, and so finally, this last this last piece, which is the forward and reputation contract. Um, uh, so, so the idea here is that uh, there's the reason we wanted to start. We want to kind of like create this set of abstractions that you know we can swap out with something else. Is because um, it's nice to have like trustless discovery, like some some like kind of understood mechanism of relayer discovery. Uh, and uh, but you know this is something we can we can play with. Uh, yeah, I'll just go through to these. 
forward contract is very simple. It just literally forwards forwards calls to the, the application contract, in this case the mixer. Yeah, and the reputation contract, yeah, I, I can talk at length about this. I don't think I will right now unless people want to talk about it. But there's uh, an ETH research post that I published with Barry Whitehat on this. So if you just Google for really just registering with research, you can kind of see our thinking there. Um, broadly, it's like, uh, you know, the more ether you've burned in service of like, in service of uh, real end transactions, maybe the higher your reputation is. But there's a lot of parameters to be tweaked there, and it's something we're still actively thinking about. Cool. Um, <clears throat> and so finally, the next steps are, uh, you know, a big part of like what I'm trying to do at DevCon is talk to a bunch of mixer teams, talk to a bunch of wallet teams, uh, see how we can integrate this into uh, like the existing flows, um, and uh, also talking to the gas station networks and some other kid trying to actually abstract from people. Cool. Um, so that's me on Twitter at the top, and that is where the repo is for surrogate. Um, probably have a lot of time for questions. How do you protect against the front runners? Uh, what do you mean by for like the relayer from getting front runners from someone else? Yeah, so like it depends on your design, how you uh, pay back to the relayer for the service. Yeah. So if I submit a transaction as a relayer, and if you return it to the message handler, then the front runner is uh, incentivized to get it because he wants to get front run you and get it. Um, there, there's sort of a trade off between. Yeah, it's something we've thought about a lot. Um, I think the easy answer is you would expect that to factor into the fee market. It's kind of part of the cost of doing business of running every day. I understand. No, but like how do you protect? Because on the first day when we launched another cash, we didn't like talk about that. So we got front run like on the first one. Like, Sorry, who got who got front run? For another cash. So then we on, our, on, our, on the on the on the first trial when we launched the mainnet. Yeah. So we got front run right away. So that's why we're like okay. So we noticed the problem. So that's why the ZK is not approved. Oh oh oh! I see what you're saying. Yeah. Well, like the the so. I, I didn't. I didn't really go into detail on this, but the address of the recipient goes. In the pre, it goes in the pre, goes in the proof. Yeah. The so, address of the relayer. Yes. So because the address of the relayer is one of the inputs in our. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because you mentioned. You can't. You can't front run. I, I didn't. I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but you you literally can't front run. I understand that. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. okay. So you're using the same protection. So, but yeah. that that means. You have to design a smart contract in a way that would uh, decode the ZK uh, proof to like, prevent from runners. Because in that proof, you have to have the address of the relay. That's right. And so that can exist in the proxy contract. Or like the thing that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, yeah I, that's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's right. So, um, if I'm a relayer and I'll get like I will, I'll, I say I will relay your transaction, but I don't. Um, what what happened there? Yeah. Uh, so this is there, there's there's actually another interesting trade off here. So like um, in designing the client logic, you can you can either broadcast to like every relayer, and then relayers kind of like are at risk. Or you can broadcast to one relayer, and then the client's kind of at risk. And, and there's you know a spectrum of like choices and and how you choose to kind of like it's like your broadcast strategy essentially and retry strategy that lie along that spectrum. We are opting towards in this implementation, and this this is open to discussion, to protect the client uh, experience. So uh, the client logic by default will try a ton of relayers mm -hmm. and like retry. So like there's more. A little bit of risk that relayers get screwed, but we'd rather they'll be competing effectively, right? Who gets first, so they can lose. Again. We'd rather push the competition to the relayers and make it a little more expensive to them than make the client experience worse. But like the the really the way to completely solve the problem is just like send it to everyone immediately. 
but then the, the rest are going to be rewires are going to lose money. Yes. So that'll factor into, yeah, so, so yeah, again, there's a trade-off here, and, and fundamentally what happens there is that just factors into like the fees, the fee market. It's like another cost. For so, but it's still, it's kind of, it's not convenient for the user, because the user will have to pay higher fees. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's paying for not having to wait. Yeah, GSN right. has the same problem, so I talked to them, they said, well, I proposed an idea maybe if they have some sort of mempools, and the reviewers can share the mempools, so they like don't execute the same transaction. Like that. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. But then, the, the obvious, well, it's there's, there's a way to grieve it, obviously. Yeah. yeah, the way to grieve it is to just not share your stuff. Yeah, but if <laughs> then, then it's like you would have to have some sort of feature man or something uh, who is going to watch this kind yeah. of stuff. And the GSN, they plan to have feature man nodes, they just have them with them. So if you say that the approach you're going is that you will kind of broadcast the transaction, this is something I want to do to all of the relayers. So how is this going to work? Because every relayer, they can have a different fee. Charge no, basically only one reviewer will succeed and this reward. Yeah, I know, but I as a customer, I mean every relayer charges a different fee and they choose which fee they want to choose. They want to. But then if I just broadcast to everybody, am I accepting like any fee? Or well, only the lowest one or yeah, would I well, specify a range that I'm willing to pay? Um, yeah, I mean, there's like a bunch, like you, you might say, uh, there's some, some predicate you can define for each successive retry, and depending on kind of like how restrictive or not restrictive that predicate is, like how much you pay and how much you weight changes. It's so like a filtered broadcast, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, oh, sorry. 
Yeah, so again, so this is, this is, I kind of went over these a little quickly, partially because we have our initial implementation, but this is something that we're exploring swapping out, or maybe even like uh, proxying some other system that's doing reputation, like gas station somewhere. But what we've implemented is uh, there's like a, a portion of each relay that you can choose the relay or portion of each relay or feed that the relay can choose to burn. And then the reputation is just a function of the number of times they've relayed and the total amount they've burned. Good. Yeah. And the most important question is in production rate. It's almost production rate. It's very close. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm left from having no pressure. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. of course. Um, I think by the end of the month. Oh. Yeah. I mean, we're we're kind of like working with you guys, like you and the other mixer applications, like in lockstep. Sure. Since I think not all like the is what you guys are already launched, but you're already launched. Yeah. How, how are you? Uh, who do you think will be the, the biggest users of these things? The mixers? <laughs> yeah. Like specifically who? The big question. <laughs> yeah, specifically who I can tell you. Um, Everyone's sending money. Do you think so? Yeah. Like, like when you send ETH or DAI or whatever, <coughs> wallets should just default. Right. To your, your sending, like, who is the case? So there's, there's something. There's one thing that's like a little tricky, which is that the anonymity set is defined by like how much you're sending. And so the reality is, like if you're sending like say 10,000 ETH, you're probably, there's probably not going to ever be a large amount of anonymity set. Um, and so there's going to be some, my guess is there's going to be some like multimodal distribution around like which specific like anonymity sets are like really popular. Can you say that money around? Well, I mean, the way I think of it is, like, you know, right now the way that, say, Tornado Cash works is that they have a specific use case, which is you're trying to disconnect the outputs from the inputs. So therefore, you have to have like this enforced same amount on on both sides. So you can't match them together. But if you look at, say, the Zcash blockchain, where they have just a shielded pool that anybody can send any amount into and then send any amount out of, um, you know, your your anonymity set becomes everybody who's ever sent money into the pool. Um, and so they don't they don't enforce like you have to send a specific amount in and a specific amount out. So people can send ten thousand ETH into the shielded pool and then send any fraction of that ten thousand ETH within the shielded pool. And it's only if if they decide to leave the pool that they might need to think about yeah. what their amount that they're sending out. Yeah, I think the shielded pool approach, actually I think this is what, like, this is broadly what UI Nightfall is doing. Like, they're kind of creating, like, you know, who knows what they're actually going to do with it, but they're trying to create some standards around a shielded pool contract. Um, I think that is useful for, this, like, I almost think of that as like a slightly separate segment of the market than mixers. Um, my big open question there, and I don't have like a, a positive or negative kind of sentiment yet, is uh, like if the shield pool gets like really, really large, how does that affect the kind of gas house? Is there a cap on how big the shield pool can be that scales up worse than market? Mm -hmm. yeah. You can have like multiple shield pools probably with a fixed amount of network tree participants, yeah. so that will not be like very expensive in terms of the gas house. Like once you fill in one shell, you go and Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that's right. So you'll have, but so you'll have segment, segmentation that might be a smaller anonymity set than a mixer, but gives you the option of like any quantity. So there's a trade-off there. Um, Tony, to kind of like answer my opinion on, on your question, um, I think it's going to largely be people who want to move small amounts of ETH to interact with contracts from addresses that are not associated. So I, I, I think it's like small amounts of ETH. I don't think it's going to yeah. be like large amounts of ETH. But all to be seen. Maybe people are betting in a controversial auger market or exactly. setting up a voting in a controversial DAO or something. Right, doing, yeah. doing things that they, they want to keep it 
Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah think about that. Yeah. Keep back your answer, like you want to RSVP, but you don't want to show the people like you have to see it. In Wasabi, I think it's mostly people that want to kind of like wash their coins and like disassociate their holdings from their real world identity. That I mean, all of your answers weren't about that. Is there a reason why you don't think that's going to be the main reason, the main driver for this? I mean, it could be a matter of like breaking the link between KYC exchanges yeah, and exactly. personal wallet. Yeah, that's a perfectly valid use case. Yeah, how does does you know Wasabi has like how does Wasabi segment based on like the amount you want to send? Do they have fixed amounts in which you can send? Um, they don't have fixed amounts, but they will like, tell you how good your anonymity set is based on how much you want to fix. They do have fixed amounts. It's a yeah. point one bitcoin. Oh sure. Yeah. Oh, well, you can from that. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. But you can you can choose to mix like you know point one. Right, right, yeah. We'll break it up into point one chunks. Looks like I'm out of time, so we'll love to take the team's discussion. <laughs>